Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning also to uh, our friends who are following this workshop on Zoom. Um, thanks for being here. Um, today we're going to talk about organic aquaculture. It's going to be an interesting workshop, I promise. And but first, for me, a couple of um, things that I'd like to say about this uh, workshop. This workshop is taking place in the context of a very large project, which is um, UMOFA. And UMOFA is the European Market Observatory for Fisheries and Aquaculture Product. And it's um, um, the main tool that the European Commission uh, set in place to deliver on market intelligence for the seafood sector. And it's an observatory that covers the entire supply chain of fisheries and aquaculture uh, throughout all of the EU member states, and also maybe wor <clears throat> worldwide. And it's essentially a project on, on data. You can find a lot of data on the prices and volumes of fish and shellfish, crustacea sold th throughout the EU. Um, and uh, along the entire value chain, which means from the first sale when fishers catch their fish until to down to retail. So when consumers buy fish um, in a supermarket, for instance. And essentially it's about data, but of course we uh, talk about market intelligence. So we, the uh, overarching objective of UMOFA is to increase uh, information and market transparency for operators, policymakers, researchers, everyone working in this industry, which is the seafood industry. Um, as part of our work, we also organize you know, events like this one, and we also produce a lot of publications. And this one, um, this workshop we are um, doing today on organic aquaculture um, do, comes from a, a publication that's uh, just been released, a study on organic aquaculture in the EU. You have it here also on paper. You can take a few copies over there if you want to. Um, and yeah, this study is quite interesting. Uh, the topic is certainly, uh, you know, um, a hot one, I would say. And UMOFA uh, did uh, um, a similar study, well, essentially the same study in 2017. And, but now, you know, um, five years after, um, it was high time for um, updating the data and see if the um, organic aquaculture sector had somehow progressed in Europe which is what we did. So we had a good look at the most recent data available and we um, had a look also at the you know, opportunities and challenges of the sector. Um, but I'm not going to dwell too much on that because I prefer you hear it from our speakers today. Just maybe take a minute if you want to, if you're interested in what we're doing at UMOFA, you can take a picture of the QR code and you can subscribe to our mailing list. I promise we won't be spamming you. We're not going to sell your personal data. Just don't worry. Your data is safe with us. So um, right now I'd like to leave the floor to um, the first speaker, Lucas Eri from the uh, UMOFA team and A&D International. And Lucas uh, was deeply involved in this study. So um, my question to you, Lucas, is just please let us know what the main takeaways are, the state of play of organic aquaculture in the EU. And yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, so with the, the UMOFA team, we updated this study we released five years ago. And so we basically, we collected um, data, um, uh, quantitative data uh, in all member states uh, to validate and complement the uh, data already, tra tra already transmitted uh, through Eurostat by uh, member states. And uh, in complement of this quantitative data, we also conducted uh, uh, several interviews with stakeholders, uh, uh, fish farmers uh, uh, involved in uh, uh, EU organic aquaculture. So, so basically, uh, the, in in 2020, the um, uh, production of uh, organic fish and shellfish in the EU uh, amounts to 74,000 tons. Um, so for comp it's about uh, almost 7% of the total volume of aquaculture produced in the EU. Uh, for comparison, for example, the, um, the, the percentage of the agricultural land uh, certified organic is 9%. Uh, the, um, the share of consumption or, uh, organic in the EU is 4.5%. 
and uh, the the share of the whole cattle produced in the EU uh, is organic is uh, six percent. So fish and shellfish is quite in the average or maybe a bit above the average of the other sector or the global sectors uh, in the food sectors. So uh, um, f within these uh, 74,000 tons, uh, what, the, what we found out is that mussel uh, and is the main uh, uh, species produced and it represents more than half of the EU production and it has become the, the, the first organic uh, fish uh, produced in the EU in a few years because uh, five years ago when we released the first study it was still salmon uh, for different reasons but uh, so in a few years there has have been a lot of uh, new farms certified especially in the De Netherlands, uh, Denmark, uh, Germany but also in Italy and France and, and Spain and so mussel has become the first uh, in volume the first product uh, certified organic and so muscle uh, organic muscle represents 10 percent of, of the whole uh, muscle production in the um, in eu with the uh, 42000 tons um the second uh, the, the second uh, species produced organically is uh, salmon and salmon is mostly organic salmon is mostly produced in uh, ireland as ireland uh, many years ago decided collectively to certify all uh, its production uh, of salmon uh, as organic uh, to dif to exploit and to differentiate uh, his uh, its products um, and uh, and uh, try to found a competitive competitive advantage um, against all other salmon uh, producers um, then comes trout which is uh, uh, trout is produced in, in uh, most all, all of um, farming countries in, in Europe and uh, so the, this production of organic trout uh, occurs in uh, many member states but um, uh, French production uh, accounts for half of the production for organic trout then comes uh, Spain and Dan Denmark um, then we have carp Carp is, is uh, mostly produced in eastern uh, uh, countries of and and also in the in the Baltic areas, um, and so most of uh, carp are uh, carp uh, product um, carp production are intensive or semi-intensive um, farms, which uh, and some of them are have been certified as organic, and so the. Production of organic carp in the EU uh, represents uh, about uh, 3,500 uh, tons um, in uh, 2020. Then we have oyster. Oyster has also uh, been increasing in the recent years, but it um, most of this uh, production is uh, is occurs in France because France represents uh, about 90% uh, of the of the oyster produ production in the EU. Um, and then we have other species like European sea bass and gilted sea bream. Uh, a, a, a small share of the production is certified organic, uh, about 2%, and, but it has increased uh, quite a lot in the recent years, especially in Greece, and uh, mostly to target export market. So, and uh, among other species with low, lower volume volumes, we can uh, we can notice, uh, for example, sturgeon in uh, in in Spain or clams in Italy. Um, considering the trends, we see that uh, there is a uh, we observed huge increases uh, in the shellfish sector, um, organic shellfish sector, whereas for fin fish. It's not so obvious, uh, and some of the main species have decreased, such as carp um, and trout, trout for a lesser extent. And um, uh, sea bass and sea bream is the only are the only fin fish uh, which have uh, increased their production uh, certified organic uh, in the five uh, last five years. When it 
when uh, considering the country where, where they are, these species are produced. Uh, so Ireland comes first uh, with 25% of the organic fish and shellfish production in the EU, mostly with salmon, as I told you, uh, all, all salmon production in Ireland is certified organic, but also mussel. Uh, then comes Italy uh, with uh, mussel and clams uh, and also trout. France with uh, all shellfish and uh, trout. Uh, and the Netherlands with a uh, mussel. So you see that uh, a lot of, of these countries, uh, their, their first uh, species certified organic is mussel. And so when you look at the, um, the figure uh, on the right side, you can see the evolution of uh, the total uh, organic uh, fish and shellfish production uh, from the last study. So 2015 figures with 2020 figures. And you see that um, most of the growth observed is due to the mussel production. Um, but also there are some um, uh, smaller uh, productions in uh, countries like Bulgaria uh, for mussel, uh, Hungary for finfish, uh, especially carp, and, um, and in Greece for sea, bam, sea bass and sea bream. So the increases um, occurred in uh, Italy, France, Netherlands, um, Greece, Denmark, and uh, Germany, mostly due to muscle, but and decreased a bit in um, Ireland, especially due to the decrease of muscle pr production, and um, in uh, decrease also in Hungary bec because of uh, less farms certified as organic, uh, especially for carp. Then in the, in this um, study we also investigated uh, the drivers of the growth uh, and the uh, obstacles of the development of uh, organic aquaculture. And um, so we identified um, several drivers. The first driver, driver is the price premium, uh, especially for finfish. And, um, but, and when there are, for shellfish, the price premium are not really easy to achieve but uh, it's compensated by access to higher value markets, uh, especially for export market. Um, among the drivers, there is also a growing uh, consumer demand and uh, awareness of, uh, for uh, organic uh, products. Uh, we can see, for example, the, the data uh, provided by the Eurobarometer sh showing an increased interest and awareness uh, for of uh, organic food. Um, other driver, the high development potential for shellfish, uh, as actually the the shellfish uh, the certification as organic is not very costly in terms of method of production for shellfish uh, farmers depend um, compared to fin finfish farmers, and so uh, um, quick conversion is is possible, as you could see on, in, in the figures, uh, quick conversion to and the quick certification process is uh, achievable for shellfish production. So there is still a high potential um, of development for the um, organic shellfish production in the EU. Um, so the, there are low extra costs. Uh, low, also low price premium, but it can give uh, producers access to new markets and uh, and high hand products. And then the last driver of the development uh, of the EU organic aquaculture is the public support support uh, for organic farming. Um, of course, with the objective uh, provided by the new uh, EU policies uh, in terms of organic uh, production. Uh, but also uh, through uh, public awareness campaigns for uh, sustainable and uh, organic uh, food and seafood. Now the barriers so and, and the obstacles to the development of uh, organic aquaculture, actually they are quite different um, between finfish and shellfish. Uh, for finfish, we identified uh, several barriers, uh, especially the the, the first barrier are the, the specific requirements and the additional cost for organ organic production in terms of um, 
uh, density in the in the farms uh, in terms of uh, animal welfare and, and in terms of of, co of course availability of uh, uh, juveniles uh, certified as organic but also uh, for organic uh, fish feed so this is uh, can be a limit and and uh, it can be farmers can be reluctant to, to go through the process um, because of this extra cost and uh, extra um, uh, administrative burden. Uh, we also noticed some um, some administrative issues um, due to different interpretation of uh, uh, EU organic requirements uh, and the translation of these requirements in the in the national uh, certification schemes and certification bodies. So um, this is mainly true for FinFish. Um, moreover, for FinFish, there are still some um, systems uh, that are not included in the certificate in the organic uh, EU organic uh, requirements, such as uh, recirculated aquaculture, uh, because it's not directly linked to the environment uh, and although we can uh, say that in some ways they are they could can be more sustainable than other uh, production methods um, they are not included in the they cannot be certified as organic so this has been um, not noticed and, and and highlighted by several uh, stakeholders as a limit to the de development of of the organic aquaculture um, on another system which is not uh, innovative but uh, a traditional system uh, especially in Eastern Europe uh, most of uh, a lot of uh, farms include several species in the same pounds so it, it's called polyculture and uh, uh, this is not allowed also in the in the uh, organic uh, scheme so this is also a limit for these countries to develop uh, uh, organic aquaculture um then we noticed a few co coherent issues between um, eu organic uh, regulation and national requirements in some member states it was uh, notably the case in uh, denmark uh, for trout uh, production and this is the main explanation of the decrease of trout uh, organic trout production in denmark um, and for shellfish there are some different um, uh, barriers and obstacles um the the main the main uh, li limit is the requirement and the classic the requirement for shellfish uh, in terms of, of uh, classific uh, water quality of the environment and so a lot of farmers are are quite uh, reluctant or at least uh, worried about the evolution of the water quality and the evolution also of the regulations in terms of requirement and then it uh, they have this uh, settles some uncertainties uh, for new conversion to organic or to keep on uh, going and building strategies uh, for their, their marketing plans. Um, shellfish producer also said that there were limited market incentive for organic shellfish. I told you that there were low price premium for organic mussel and oyster, for example. So this is a limit uh, compared to, to finfish. Um, and there are also more general uh, um, barriers um, shared by both uh, shellfish and finfish. Um, one is the competition with other sustainability schemes, as you know, uh, because as you know that the aquaculture products uh, represent about a quarter of the um, of the, the fish and shellfish uh, consumption in Europe, in, in the EU, that means that uh, 75% are, are wild caught. So it's not always easy to, to make understand uh, and to, to aware a consumer about what is a sustainable seafood, uh, depending on, on if it's farmed or if it's wild caught. And uh, so there is a competition uh, on the market and, the and also a competition to uh, to uh, incent consumers to 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 choose uh, uh, organic seafood uh, against, uh, for example, uh, um, 
wild caught uh, fish uh, certified as sustainable. So it can be confusing for uh, consumers. So in conclusion, I would say that there are some uh, good prospects for growth for uh, organic aquaculture, especially in the shellfish sector. And uh, all will depend on, of course, the evolution of the demand, especially in the context of uh, uh, the strong inflation. Uh, but also, the, if uh, the, given the limit that uh, these uh, barriers and obstacles are uh, dealt with in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas, for this uh, quite comprehensive presentation. It's uh, never easy to condense a study that took several months to be carried out into just uh, 10 minutes. Anyway, um, thanks a lot, it's quite interesting. And uh, now before um, uh, I leave the floor to our next speaker, I would just like to remind to everyone who's following this session on Zoom that you can open the Zoom chat and start asking questions to our speakers. Because um, after presentations, we're gonna leave some 30 minutes for um, a question and answer session. So you can start asking your questions we collect, we'll be collecting them and then I'll read them out loud for our speakers. And of course, those of you who are here in flesh and bones, you, you'll also have a chance to ask questions to our speakers. Um, so we had the main takeaways from this study on organic aquaculture. Now maybe it might be time to hear a bit um, the policy context as well. Um, so next speaker, and apologies if in the program you read Emilia, uh, Emilia, something came up at the very last minute, so she couldn't be here physically. And, uh, but we have, I wouldn't even call it a replacement. We have Birgit van Tongelen, senior expert on aquaculture in Digimare. So um, uh, she's, she's joining from remote. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to hear from her about the policy context at EU level, how organic aquaculture fits into the wider aquaculture framework. But Birgit, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Alessandro. Um, Alessandro, will you upload my presentation? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so good morning, everybody. My name is um, Birgit van Tongele. I work in the European Commission in DG Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, where I'm a member of the aquaculture team. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, apologize for not being physically present, but um, I'm replacing in the last moment uh, Emilia, as Alessandro said, who tested positive for Corona. Um, but I think after two years of Corona pandemics, we are used to uh, virtual meetings, so um, that will be no, no problem. Um, in my presentation today, I would like to give you a brief overview of the initiatives that were developed in the last two years that are relevant for organic uh, aquaculture, such as the European Green Deal, the Farm to Fork strategy, uh, the new strategic guidelines for EU aquaculture, the new action plan on organic farming, and the new regulation on organic farming. So as you can see, a lot happened over the last uh, years, um, which is related to uh, aquaculture. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, yeah. Two years ago, the Commission adopted the Farm to Fork strategy, which is a key element of the European Green Deal. The aim of the Farm to Fork strategy is to accelerate the transition to a sustainable food system. And the Farm to Fork, the farm -to -fork strategy has four general goals, notably to reduce the environmental and climate footprint of the EU food system, to contribute to the global transition towards sustainability from farm to fork and protect the future generations and our planet. A third objective is to lead to new and sustainable business opportunities for small and also for large businesses. And finally, to create a robust and a resilient food system in light of climate change and biodiversity, but also in light of the recent crises like pandemic and uh, like a war in uh, Ukraine, so a resilient food system. Organic farming will play an essential role in developing a sustainable food system in the EU because it promotes high quality food with low environmental impact. 
in the farm to fork strategy, there is also uh, the importance of blue food uh, acknowledged. Um, it recognizes that potential, the potential of seafood as a low carbon source of food and feed. And it recognizes also the role of the fishers and the aquaculture producers in building a sustainable blue food system. Next slide, please. It is important to note that the farm to fork strategy includes specific targets for aquaculture. So the first target is to significantly increase organic aquaculture. And a second target is to reduce the sales of antimicrobials in aquaculture by 50%. So these are two important targets specifically focused to aquaculture. The farm to fork strategy also underlines that organic farming is an environmentally friendly production method that needs to be further promoted. There is a, a growing demand for quality food production with high environmental biodiversity and animal welfare standards and aquaculture, organic aquaculture can definitely respond to this demand. So in conclusion, we can say that the farm to fork strategy and the European Green Deal, so this new political context, that it has given a stronger role for aquaculture, but also for organic aquaculture. Next slide, please. In light of this new political context, the Commission has revised the strategic aquaculture guidelines of 2013. The new revised guidelines, they were also explicitly mentioned in the farm to fork strategy so they were already announced that they were coming they were adopted by the adopted by the commission in may last year and i must say that they were the result of um, more than one year of close consultation with um, member states experts on aquaculture and also with the aquaculture advisory council uh, what are the guidelines they develop in fact a common vision for EU member states and for all the relevant stakeholders for the further development of uh, aquaculture in the EU in a way that contributes to the objectives of the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. As you can see, there are four horizontal um, specific horizontal objectives, notably building resilience and competitiveness of the EU aquaculture sector. Secondly, to ensure that aquaculture participation participates in the green transition, ensure social acceptance of aquaculture, as well as providing appropriate information to consumers. And then finally, also an important uh, objective is to increase the knowledge and the innovation in the aquaculture sector. So apart from these objectives, the guidelines identify 13 different areas where further work is needed and they are grouped under these four uh, horizontal objectives. And um, for example, one of the key areas is to improve environmental performance or to improve animal health, animal welfare. Uh, communication is also an important uh, key area for further work. And then in the annex of the strategic guidelines, um, there are there is an action plan so there are actions concrete recommendations for actions for the 13 areas identified and these are actions not only for the commission but also for the member states and for the aquaculture advisory council next slide please there are two key areas for further work that are identified in the guidelines under the horizontal direct uh, objective participating in the green transition. And two key areas are relevant for organic aquaculture, notably improving the environmental performance of the EU aquaculture sector, and secondly, improving animal welfare. And this, so improving animal environmental performance and improving animal welfare can be achieved by promoting organic aquaculture because the environmental performance and a better performance in terms of animal welfare are both intrinsically um, linked to organic aquaculture. So therefore, the guidelines encourage the member states and the stakeholders to support the increase in organic production. Um, 
but also the Commission encouraged the member states to include uh, an increase in the organic aquaculture in their national strategic plans for aquaculture. So for the moment, member states are revising their national strategic plans for aquaculture, and the Commission is encouraging the member states to increase uh, or to put an increase in organic aquaculture in, these, in their strategic plans as well. Also, the um, European Maritime Fishery and Aquaculture Fund provides opportunities um, for farmers um, to, to support um, them with um, adequate tools and capacity to deliver on uh, organic aquaculture. Another aspect is that the Commission will facilitate the exchange of best practices and innovation on organic aquaculture in the context of the open method of coordination. Um, this is, for instance, the, the technical seminars that the Commission is uh, organizing twice a year with the uh, member states um, experts on aquaculture. So in this context, we will um, exchange best practices on organic aquaculture. And then finally, in the context of the implementation of the strategic guidelines, uh, the Commission intends to set up a uh, dedicated uh, website on um, so a website on organic aquaculture on aquaculture. Sorry, and there will be a dedicated chapter on organic aquaculture where all the information is gathered, and and that will be uh, user friendly and easily accessible for all the stakeholders, but also for the general public. So that is, in a nutshell, um, how organic um, aquaculture is addressed in the strategic guidelines for um, aquaculture. Next slide, please. And then we have the EU action plan on organic farming, another initiative from the European Commission. So this action plan was adopted by the Commission in March last year. Um, the plan aims to, to boost the production and the consumption of organic products and to improve also the sustainability of organic production um, in order to reach the targets that are set in the farm to fork um, strategy. Um, for aquaculture, the target was to significantly increase organic aquaculture. Um, as you can see in this slide, um, the action plan is broken down into three axes. The first axe is um, stimulate demand and ensure consumer trust. So it will um, um, contain a lot of um, actions that aim to stimulate demand and ensure consumer trust. The second axis is to stimulate conversion and reinforce the entire value chain. And the third axis is um, to improve the contribution of organic farming to environmental sustainability. Next slide, please. So in total, the action plan on organic farming um, includes 23 actions on organic farming, but there are five actions that are specifically focused on aquaculture. For example, the two actions um, to reinforce uh, organic aquaculture. The first important action is that the commission will identify and address as appropriate any specific obstacles to the growth of EU aquaculture. We have already heard in the EMOFA study that there are obstacles to the growth, to, to the further growth of um, organic aquaculture. So this action in the action plan is targeted um, to look into the obstacles and uh, to, to find solutions for the obstacles. I can tell you that um, the relevant services, notably DG Mare and DG Agri, have started um, to work on this, and we have um, we have already developed a preliminary analysis analysis on the different obstacles um, to the growth of the EU aquaculture. Um, and for this, we have based ourselves on input from member states uh, and stakeholders. And also the results of this new EMOFA study um, will feed into this analysis. For the moment, it's still an internal working document, so it's not publicly yet, but we are continuing to work on it. The second important action um, specifically focused on uh, organic aquaculture is that the Commission intends to support research and innovation 
uh, on organic aquaculture. And in relation to this, I can inform you that we are discussing with PG Research uh, to include a topic on organic aquaculture in the Horizon Europe Work Program 2023-2024. So in, in order to, to respect our commitments in this um, organic farming action plan. Um, furthermore, there, are, there is an action on the promotion of more efficient and sustainable use of water, the increased use of renewable energy and clean transport and the reduction of nutrient release in organic farming. This will be implemented in the context of the new strategic guidelines uh, where we intend to develop a guidance document on environmental performance and organic aquaculture will there be addressed as well. Finally, uh, in addition to these specific actions on uh, aquaculture in the action plan, there, the, the plan also contains a number of general actions on organic farming that will of course also cover um, aquaculture. For example, one of the actions is enhance animal welfare in the context of the EU animal welfare platform. So, the platform will also look at aquaculture and promoting organic farming will of course also include uh, aquaculture. Uh, next slide, please. I hate to be saying this, Birgit, but please, I need to be strict. Please wrap up. Yeah. I will be very quick on the new regulation on organic farming that was, that applies since January of this year. Um, for aquaculture, there are not so many differences between the new and the old organic production rules, but they relate finally to the new stricter criteria for the water quality of organic shellfish, to the frequency of parasite treatment, and to listing of substances and products that can be used in organic aquaculture. Uh, I can say that we have already received some questions on the interpretation of some provisions and that we are um, that we are um, addressing this with clarification letters that we sent to the member states and that will be put on the website. So, so the commission will, um, or, or has set up a um, webpage on organic farming and there will be a section on frequently asked questions where all the replies to possible questions in the context of this new re regulation will be addressed. Voila, this is finally, uh, this is uh, what I wanted to say on all these new elements, um, EU um, initiatives that relate to organic um, aquaculture. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Birgit. Thank you for joining, um, even from remotely. Uh, and I think it's quite interesting because it seems to me that the stars are aligning. They're not yet fully aligned, but we have a favorable policy context. Things are you know, slowly changing. and there is potential for organic aquaculture to continue growing. But if you, you probably noticed that so far we've been focusing mostly, if not entirely, on uh, fish and shellfish. And these are, you know, uh, delicious. Uh, but uh, aquaculture is not about, um, just about fish and shellfish. Um, it also happens to be about Seaweed, for instance. And now they, in the Umofa study on organic aquaculture, um, seaweed, I think it was probably the most difficult part. Uh, Data-wise, it's nearly impossible to get precise data on seaweed farming, and that's just seaweed farming. So you can imagine how difficult it can be to get precise data on, um, on, on organic seaweed farming. Luckily, um, there are a lot of initiatives around that are trying um, advancing seaweed and, uh, and organic seaweed, but you have only one that is going at such a large scale, and it's the initiative that Antoine uh, launched uh, quite recently, actually. So, um, Antoine, I would like to hear from you, what is seaweed first? What are you pursuing with seaweed first? How you are advancing organic aquaculture? Uh, seaweed, um, organic seaweed farming, sorry, please. Thank you, hi everyone. Uh, so as Alessandro just said, so I am the co-founder of Seaweed First. So we are a French data-driven nonprofit that really focuses on helping accelerate organic seaweed aquaculture and improve its social and environmental impact. Before diving a bit deeper into what we do, I think it's important to understand how we got there. Um, the first thing we realize is that today there's a crisis of passivity between the different actors around the sustainability space. 
a lot of people are putting very ambitious objectives to reduce carbon emissions, to uh, do more sustainable aquaculture, to do all these different practices. But unfortunately, there's always one blocking element, whether it's regulations, whether it's investment, whether it's uh, uh, partnerships. And so unfortunately, everyone is blocked and they're not having ne the necessary information to keep moving forward. And this is where uh, the problem really lies. Today, we're also, we're generally talking about sustainability, about green in some cases, but today to really make the positive impact, especially in the aquaculture space, we need to go towards more regenerative models that will not only impact the economic uh, side of the business, but also the communities they work with and the oceans they also uh, use to produce. And thankfully, uh, as some may know, seaweed is a very valuable tool to create this regenerative model. On one side, the economic potential of this, uh, of this crop, as we may say, is very important as it can be used in, in lower tier products such as bioenergy, ecosystem services. Then, as many of you know, it's used in food. It's also used in biostimulants in agriculture, also used in feed. Uh, a lot of people are talking about it to reduce methane emissions for cows. Uh, another popular topic is as well biomaterials with bioplastics, textiles, and, um, and bricks. But then we also have some very high tier applications going from cosmetics, nutraceuticals, and finally pharmaceuticals, which have been very looked upon, especially uh, in the last two years for their potential to fight against COVID. Uh, but the benefit of seaweed as well is that it has some very powerful ecosystem services. On one side, of course, it plays a huge role with carbon capture. So this is a very heated debate at the moment in the seaweed space, but nonetheless, seaweed as an application can also work on carbon avoidance, which is much more important down the line. Secondly, we also have nitrate capture. So all the ni excess nitrogen coming from uh, the cities and the agriculture, thankfully seaweed can capture that to make it grow faster and reduce eutrophication. And uh, these are effects we can see notably in Europe in areas such as uh, Brittany or even in the Baltic Sea. Other ones go from coastal protection uh, to reduce wave, uh, wave power, ocean de deacidification, biodiversity protection. But what's also important is that seaweed is also very viable and a good alternative to poverty stricken communities to have an alternative to mass tourism. And so we've had plenty of examples, notably in Indonesia, uh, where during COVID they lost a lot, of, uh, a lot of revenue and they turned towards seaweed farming and it actually ended up being a very powerful alternative for those communities. So why isn't seaweed aquaculture accelerating? Unfortunately, today, the absence of quality data is really slowing down the market. People have a very limited understanding of uh, what the production methods are, what the quality standards are, the regulations, the pricing, uh, the buyers, or even the producers. And so all these different actors together, actions together, are really slowing down how things should be going forward. <laughs> So our goal really um, at Seaweed First is to actually help people find their own seaweed solutions and become a central platform to monitor, assess, and improve the regenerative potential of organic seaweed aquaculture around the world. So how do we wanna do this? So our platform is really going to be used for three main actors. Uh, so the farms themselves, governments, uh, buyers, and investors, so that's four, sorry. Um, and the objective for them is to really get real-time data on the seaweed industry through different parameters that I'm gonna mention just afterwards so that they can not only build their commercial strategy but also evaluate the environmental and social impact that organic seaweed aquaculture can have on coastal communities and on the oceans. So how are we going to do this? So uh, our goal is through our platform to provide different uh, types of data coming from satellite imagery, oceanographic data, biodiversity directly from the seaweed farms, biochemical, and as well uh, blockchain and all these different elements to protect that data for the, for the security of all the users. And the goal afterwards is for each person that will be using this data to have the appropriate solutions for them. So on one side, it can have a commercial aspect. So how can you build uh, your, uh, your regenerative ingredient sourcing how can you build a customized seaweed strategy to actually help inset the carbon emissions of your company or directly see exactly what are the best solutions for me as an alternative to bioplastics to textiles that we have on the market today. The second element is the seaweed sustainability index. This is a product that we're developing exclusively for the farms. So this index will kind will regroup different criteria going from production ESG um, data and as well financial, uh, financial criteria to assess the strengths and liabilities of the farms. 
and this will help us have a better understanding of how to help them and what solutions we can put forward so we can improve their performances and attract more investments and more commercial deals down the line. As well, of course, uh, so th this data platform is going to also follow all the ESG impacts. A lot of people are looking into seaweed to help solve all the challenges we have today, whether they're social, environmental, or even linked to food, food security. So our, all role, our role with this data is to start understanding the real impact seaweed can have on the communities and how we can answer and help governments, institutions, and investors move forward on these matters. Finally, education training. This is very important for us. Uh, some of you may already know a bit about seaweed, which is amazing. Uh, if some don't, our goal here is also to raise awareness and help people understand the potential seaweed can have, whether it's from a business perspective or just from pure passion, like uh, some of us have. <laughs> so what, the, or what are the ex expected outcomes for us around this? So first of all, is to work on quality, ensure that organic seaweed farming around the world produces very high quality seaweed that can be used for very high value applications. Secondly, work on transparency. So use the data in a way that it can help everyone without harming or creating, of course, uh, disadvantages for the farms and the smaller stakeholders. Set thirdly, work on growth. So of course, expand organic agriculture, not only in Europe, but globally as well. And finally, innovation. So finding new collaborations, new partnerships to make this industry move forward, not only think within the silo of the seaweed space, but also work with finfish, energy, tourism, and all these other sectors. I'm going to fly by this. This is so our strength. So we're already working with seven farms around the world to do the test pilots of our project. Hopefully, we'd like to integrate many more down the line. Um, and of course, we are looking into Europe because it is one of the key areas, and they have a global reach because people generally think of Europe as continental Europe, but they have numerous islands and territories around the world that can also have a positive impact. This is my last little element I wanted to share for those who are very interested in learning more. On June 2nd, we are organizing the first uh, seaweed, virtual seaweed telethon. So the goal for us is to help raise awareness around the seaweed space and allow everyone to access the necessary information, whether it's on aquaculture, whether it's on investment, on food, on pharmaceuticals, and really meet the different actors. So it is on Zoom, it can be tough, but we're on a virtual platform. So there's the opportunity of having a virtual exposition where you can actually meet directly the companies working in the space. You can chat and as well, you can help support us because uh, of course the goal of a telethon is to actually uh, collect money so we can help supporting these farms and help accelerate organic aquaculture. Thank you very much. Okay, impressive and impressive time management skills as well. Thank you very much. So now it's time for questions. Do we have any questions from the room? Oh, yes, please. Thank you very much for this interesting talk and um, I felt very inspired that you're doing this. So thanks so much for, for having this energy. Uh, I was highly appealed when you said you had a sustainability index of seaweed. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what, what that is? I mean, sustainability has all these different dimensions and uh, one of which would be also cultural sustainability or governance sustainability, just, just out of curiosity. Uh, no, it's a good question. So uh, the goal for us is to do a simplified tool um, that will enable a fast understanding of how the farms actually operate and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, we, uh, after speaking with a lot of farms, we understood that certifications can be very tedious for them, very expensive, very time consuming, and sometimes they don't have the return on investments. So we wanted to provide a tool that is accessible for them and that can provide the necessary information afterwards for investors and, and uh, buyers to quickly understand how they work. Regarding the sustainability, I know it's a word that's, um, you know, it, it means, billions of different things. Our goal for us here is um, to, to just say, okay, how can we show that it's not only a business, but it also has a positive impact on the entire, entire supply chain, uh, going from the communities and the oceans themselves. And so of course, the goal for us is to take metrics, of course, of the production methods, so how they produce and how, how they consume, but also of the impact itself it has on the communities, on, uh, on the environment and all these different aspects. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, while you're thinking about your questions, I'm going to ask a few questions um, from the 
people that are watching the workshop from Zoom. Um, maybe we can start with a question, a couple of questions for Lucas. One is from Juliana. Um, Juliana is wondering that, I mean, in, in, in uh, um, aquaculture, in, uh, sorry, in agriculture, the, uh, the um, EU regulation uh, allows the use of small percentages of chemicals, for instance, uh, and she, she'd like to know whether this is also the case for aquaculture, if, I mean, to what extent chemicals can be used even in organic aquaculture. Uh, it, I would say it depends on the species and, uh, and the production. I, I think maybe Birgit will know a bit better about the regulation aspects, but uh, uh, I know that for each uh, new species, a specific scheme is uh, set with a specific requirements uh, in terms of density, in terms of use of antibiotics and, and, uh, and uh -huh. chemicals. But of course, they are also very reduced compared to the conventional, conventional system. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's species dependent then. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple more questions. One is, but I think you touched upon them later on in your presentation. One is, uh, if we analyze the competition on the market between organic farm fish and wild caught fish, but you touched upon that. And yes, of course, you mentioned that it sometimes can be difficult for consumers yeah. as well to perceive the... Yeah, actually, yeah, actually it's very, it's, it's not easy to convince consumers that, uh, that uh, what, I mean, the, to, to establish a clear definition of what is uh, sustainable uh, in seafood, because uh, in, it depend on the, the, the perception of what is sustainable in seafood is very different among uh, countries, depending on their uh, food culture. And, uh, and for example, in, uh, in southern countries in Europe, uh, most of people uh, looking for sustainable seafood will rather prefer white cold seafood, so they will rather uh, look for uh, for uh, uh, wild caught seafood sustainable, certified as sustainable, and will not look at uh, what uh, at, at farmed seafood uh, in priority. So it's not easy to to show consumer that both system exists and they can be both uh, yeah. considered as sustainable. And another question is if we analyzed also the um, you know the, the, the relationships between organic um, versus other sustainability labels with our, which are not necessarily organic if there's any interactions competition and and so on yeah of course there are market competition because uh, for example for there are other uh, private labels for uh, sustainable uh, aquaculture and so the there are, there is a competition on the market but um, the feedback we had from farmers is that um, most of the, these private labels are actually more expensive because they most of the time they include some fees on each product uh, sold, uh, whereas the organic uh, certification is also costly in terms of administrative burden, mm -hmm. but uh, does not include any royalty to mm -hmm. be paid for the, the label. So. It depends on the market you are targeting, yeah. Uh, actually. Yeah, don't say too much, otherwise these people uh, will not be reading the study. So just keep it secret. Uh, no, thanks. Um, then I have a couple of questions for Birgit as well. I hope she's still um, online. Uh, first question is quite easy. Um, someone from Zoom is asking if it's possible to participate in the exchange best practices and innovation meetings that you mentioned before that are held twice a year. Unfortunately, not. These are uh, experts that are nominated so from the different uh, member states, experts in aquaculture. But um, we will, as I said, uh, in, uh, as a follow up to the implementation of the strategic guidelines, we will set up a website. And in this website, that will include a knowledge base where all the best practices will be included and will be uh, easily accessible. Um, so you can you can consult them there, and the website will uh, be ready or or a first um, um, version of the web, of the website will be ready by the end of this year. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question that m might be for you uh, is um, from Bruno. Um, if it's Possible to know how uh, Digimare and probably also Digiagri, although, okay, you, you can't speak for them probably, um, they want to deal with the um, problem of uh, in certain regions of decreasing 
water quality. Um, it's also mentioned here that in, with the new stricter criteria, um, less than 50% of the coastal EU water bodies may um, fit this, this stricter criteria, and this may be a um, you know, barrier to the development of organic farming. So do you, <coughs> have, you, have you tackled this, or do you have an answer for that? Well, the, the new stricter water quality requirements for organic shellfish farming in the new regulation are an issue that come up uh, quite often, either because um, they seem to be a bit unclear for the member states and for the stakeholders for that. We have um, written these uh, clarification letters that will be put on the website. But the idea was that um, we installed stricter water quality um, requirements to be able to distinguish between, between organic and conventional um, um, aquaculture, uh, because there are not a lot of other uh, pr um, criteria for, uh, to distinguish between the two. Of course, um, when it becomes too difficult, we will have to see um, how to deal with it. Um, it can be considered as an obstacle. And as, as I said, we will address all the obstacles and see what um, will be possible to, or, or how, what a possible solution could be to address. But at this moment, we, we don't know yet. OK, thank you very much, Bigit. Um, any questions from the audience, the, the live audience, I mean? No, then I'm gonna, um, you know, um, take my chances and uh, uh, exploit my position here to ask a question myself. Uh, my question is for Antoine, because I uh, must admit I was blissfully and proudly ignorant, and I, I thought that seaweed was organic by definition, uh, which in fact it isn't. I mean, it grows in the ocean, so what's wrong with that? Um, uh, but uh, no, the question is on on. Um, the certification, okay? If, if you want to market your product, if you want to label it as organic, you need to have a certification. And we, and we know that uh, it has a, a cost. And then, of course, you also need to um, comply with certain um, environmental criteria. So how does that enter into the equation? I mean, do you know if it's particularly, for instance, expensive or if the um, conditions the criteria are particularly strict, and also how does that differentiate production? For instance, in Europe, they certify organic against production that comes from other regions of the world with less stringent criteria and not organic, probably by definition. Uh, no, it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky question for a lot of seaweed farmers, uh, especially in the beginning. Uh, seaweed farming is a very capital intensive business. And uh, if they want the certification, of course, to get that extra visibility, it's going to be extra costs. So for them, it's really something they need to think about. And um, unfortunately, today, the regulations between all the different countries are not the same. Uh, and this is also a huge barrier to entry for a lot of people that, have, uh, that want to expand their businesses globally because certain parameters for heavy metals, for iodine, all these different elements are very different, uh, whether you want to sell in the US, China, or in Europe. So unfortunately, um, there's still a need to harmonize regulations globally. If we really want to start thinking about certifications and tools to really harmonize afterwards the quality. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I hope that answered the question. Yes, please, Lucas. Uh, just, just to complement on this question of, on the extra cost of certification, actually, there are some, uh, th this problem can be dealt with uh, the collective actions. Uh, we, we saw that, for example, in the muscle sector, um, there were different uh, strategies among uh, member states and in northern countries um, the certification were collective certification mostly uh, so financed by the organi organizer uh, producer organizations and so this may be a, a good uh, way to reduce the cost uh, for individual farms mm -hmm. it's to uh, apply collectively for certification yeah makes total sense yes and um, okay people are still being a bit shy, I would again uh, exploit my position here and ask uh, two more questions to uh, Birgit, because there's also, I was also thinking that th this event uh, uh, is attended by a lot of researchers as well. So I was wondering first whether the European Commission is funding uh, research on, on organic aquaculture, especially because, yes, I mean, it's uh, research is fundamental to any economic activity. And the second question is also if 
you're doing, you, when I say you, I mean the Commission, are doing um, something also on the side of um, consumer awareness. Thank you, Alessandra, for your question. Um, yes, so research, I can confirm that um, the Commission is doing research on organic uh, aquaculture. For instance, there was the, the project Ora Aqua, that was the, an FP7 project, so from the previous um, work, um, framework program. That was to, um, the aim was to develop science-based recommendations for further development of the regulatory framework and also science-based recommendations to help develop the, the growth of the sector. So that was FP7, but also under the Horizon 2020, um, there is research funded on organic aquaculture, but it are, the, the projects are not solely focusing on organic aquaculture. It's mainly pro big projects on aquaculture where there is also a part on organic uh, um, aquaculture, like for instance, Future EU Aqua uh, is an important um, project, Perform Fish um, and, and many others. And then um, on, for the new, for the Horizon Europe, which is the new framework program, as I said in my presentation, we are now pushing to include a, a topic which is uh, devoted completely to organic aquaculture for the work program 2023-2024. So that is um, concerning research. We are really pushing to, um, to be able to commit, um, uh, to um, deliver on our commitments from the action plan. Um, your second question concerns consumer awareness. Yeah, if if you're working also on the side of consumer awareness. Yeah. Yes, we we realize that um, that this is an important action. It is also um, identified in the strategic guidelines um, as an important action. And of course, the lack of uh, consumer awareness is also valid for organic aquaculture. Um, what are we doing? Um, the promotion of organic farming and the logo are foreseen in the new organic farming action plan. It's in, in general, but it will, of course, um, there will be um, activities on aquaculture as well. And then in the context of the implementation of the strategic guidelines, I can, um, I can announce that we are developing tools for an EU-wide communication campaign, and that will also develop organic aquaculture. And we will then disseminate the tools to the member states and to the stakeholders that they can use these tools for their communication campaign as well. And of course, in the website that we will set up by the end of this year, um, the dedicated page on organic uh, aquaculture that will be user-friendly and easily accessible also for the general public will help for this as well. Thank oh, you. Brilliant, that's quite good news then. Thanks a lot, Birgit. And so I think now it's last chance for you to ask a question to these distinguished speakers. If there are no more questions, I think you can, you, we can wrap up here. You could put the presentation back, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, just I remind you once again, if you want to, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, you can just take a picture of the QR code. And yes, you MoFa, it's the one and only EU Commission Observatory that delivers market intelligence on fisheries and aquaculture. So thanks a lot, and enjoy your lunch now.